Okay, I'm going to assume that everybody can hear me, um, so I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Annalise Sparks. I'm the Social Media and Communications Coordinator at the Joe Negro Foundation. If you're not familiar with the Joe Negro Foundation, uh, we provide education, awareness, and support for patients who have suffered from a brain aneurysm, AVM, and or a hemorrhagic stroke. We have a large community of survivors and caregivers in our online support groups, as well as 40 su support groups across the U.S. and Canada. And we're extremely excited for our webinar today during Brain Aneurysm Awareness Month. Today's webinar is titled 10 Things to Know About Ruptured Brain Aneurysms. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Michael Chen. Dr. Chen is the Associate Professor of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Radiology at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Chen, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Annalise. Just before we begin, um, so everybody knows, um, it, the chat box should be in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. So if you have any questions during the webinar today, feel free to pop them in there, and I'll be filtering them to Dr. Chen. Um, and if there are any questions after the webinar um, concludes, then we'll go ahead and um, answer them. Before we begin, we wanted to run a couple poll questions just to see who's in our audience today. So I'm going to run the first poll, if you guys would so kindly uh, answer. So the first question is, um, are you a brain aneurysm survivor? So you guys can feel free to answer that and I'll close it in about 30 seconds or so. And we have about 70% um, 70, 70 of you are brain aneurysm uh, survivors. So that's awesome. Um, thank you guys for joining us today. Um, and I'm gonna run one more poll. If you are a survivor, uh, did you have a ruptured or unruptured brain aneurysm? And 71% of you um, have had a ruptured brain aneurysm and 29% unruptured. Um, so thank you guys for uh, answering those questions. And I am going to hand things off to Dr. Chen now. So I'm going to make him the presenter. So just bear with us for one moment. Thank you, Annalise. And I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, participate in this webinar. I think, you know, this really speaks to really wonderful effort and energy on the part of Joe Negro Foundation to take the effort and uh, energy to, you know, develop these types of outreach uh, mechanisms that I hopefully will provide value to sort of the brain aneurysm survivor community. community. Um, so today, you know, just a little bit of context. I've been in practice for about 10 years at Rush. You know, I, I the the most common the type of diagnosis that of patients that I take care of are patients with brain aneurysms. And over that time, I've been fortunate to notice patterns in what patients ask the most questions about and see what topics they care the most about. It's certainly a traumatic experience as most brain aneurysms rupture without any kind of warning. Really, no one is prepared for this and things that happen subsequently can oftentimes feel like a blur. And even more, most of the patients after they've had a ruptured aneurysm don't even remember anything from the weeks that they were in the hospital. So a lot of what can trouble patients are the anxiety that's associated with not just feeling so vulnerable, but also wondering about what made, if this could happen again. So hopefully these are sort of 10 concepts that I thought would be pretty helpful just to be aware of, hopefully to help make sense of what happened maybe provide a little background knowledge for when you go in for your next office visit. And then, you know, in the process, hopefully be, you know, a little therapeutic as well. So to start things off, I think it's really important to realize that brain aneurysms, you know, for number one is brain arteries. These, oftentimes people talk, refer to these as blood vessels. Some patients oftentimes refer to them as veins, but it's important to realize that arteries, I mean, aneurysms are problems related to arteries. These are muscular vessels which transmit blood pumped by the heart to cells of the brain and you know obviously any other organ in the body and tissue. And so blood in the arteries are under pressure. Every waking and sleeping moment your heart's transmitting blood under pressure through these vessels. And the cells that normally line the walls of these arteries are constantly growing and remodeling in response to the stresses uh, created by the pressure of the arterial blood. And uh, ideally, the blood flows in a very, in a unidirectional laminar fashion, and that induces the least amount of stress uh, to the walls of the artery. 
So with that in mind, it's also important to know that the aneurysm arterial anatomy up in the brain is uh, very unique in the sense that unlike anywhere else in the body, the, after the arteries have branched, when they get to the base of the brain, just in front of the brain stem, they actually reconnect again. And that's that reconnection actually forms a bit of a circle and it's referred anatomically as the circle of Willis. This is a wonderful mechanism of redundancy uh, in the brain, such that if there's any problem or blockage of blood flow in one artery, the other blood, ves blood, the other blood vessels can fairly quickly pick up the slack and keep blood flow to the entire brain uh, without interruption. So as, you know, as with many things, there's also a cost associated with that. So the cost here is that at these reconnections, and I'm not sure if my little arrow is showing up, but this would be one reconnection or one reconnection here. There's actually at certain regions, bi-directional blood flow and, and ex excessive turbulent blood flow. And that can over time cause extra stress on certain segments of the wall of the artery and lead to ineffective remodeling of those cells that normally exist there. And as a result, the pressure you know, of, of the blood in the arteries wins and you form these weakened sacs. And these weakened sacs are ultimately what form aneurysms. So because of that, aneurysms, and this is an illustration from a very well-written article by Brisbane in the New England Journal uh, some years back, showing that aneurysms occur in very predictable locations, which follows those sort of rules. Aneurysms typically occur either at branching points or at the outer curve of blood vessels. And oftentimes at these regions where you have this bi-directional or excessive turbulent blood flow, the most two most common locations are referred to as the anterior communicating artery uh, region aneurysms, as well as the posterior communicating artery regions. Both of those regions combine for over 50% of all where aneurysms are located. So it's also important to realize when you look at this picture that the arteries are, these aneurysms exist in a space outside of the brain tissue itself. And they are actually sort of floating in this cerebral spinal fluid space, just at the base of the brain in front of the brain stem. And so they don't have much supportive connective tissue around them. And when they, you know, we'll go over bleeding in a little bit, it, it sort of lends itself to a certain pattern of bleeding. So that's number two. So number three is, how is a diagnosis of a ruptured brain aneurysm made? Um, most often it starts off as a very fairly vague uh, and nondescript symptom, which is simply a bad headache. Um, oftentimes people describe it as the worst headache of their life or just an unusual headache, unlike anything they've experienced before. And as you can imagine, headaches, much like abdominal pain, can have, you know, it could be caused by something very benign or something very serious. And it's very hard oftentimes to tell just based on, you know, subjective feelings or descriptions, how bad, the, you know, if there's something serious going on. So um, oftentimes what we really rely on, on to determine whether we should get a scan is, is this headache of an unusual severity or you know, uh, nature, or if this just persists and it's unlike anything that's been experienced before. And if that's the case, uh, we usually, uh, th those patients are usually seen in the emergency room and it's a pretty low threshold to obtain a CT scan of the brain. And these two images are representation of a normal CT scan of the brain, somebody without a rupture or bleeding in the brain. You can see the very dark, uh, very bright white rim around it. That's just the skull. And inside of it is the brain. The one on the left is a little bit is a cut from below. At the top of the scan is the front of the head. At the bottom is the back of the head. On the, this side is the left side ear. The, this side is the right ear. And you can see that, and then the cut above it is just another slice of the brain above it. So you can see that the brain is fairly full. It takes up most of the space in the brain, but there's a space around it that's dark that represents the cerebrospinal fluid that is bathing the brain. So when an aneurysm ruptures, uh, as you can see the aneurysm sitting in the subarachnoid space, blood then leaks, as you can see here, into these space, spaces that surround the brain. Um, and so this would be a CT scan on the right. And you can see this dark area here in the middle is really where that circle of Willis is sort of situated. 
And if an aneurysm is occurring there, sorry about that. Um, for example, a posterior commuting artery aneurysm could lead to a pattern of bleeding that we see on the right here. So you can see that what was previously dark spaces is now filled with this brighter material, which on a CT scan looks bright, which represents blood. And you can see how the blood has sort of uh, found its way around these spaces uh, that normally surround the brain. And that's how the diagnosis is made of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And usually by the pattern of the hemorrhage, you can assume, you can, you can guess if it's related to either trauma or related to an aneurysm. Sometimes the CT scan does not show uh, blood, and there's still a high suspicion based on the symptoms that you have that there may be something ominous like bleeding in the brain that a lumbar puncture is done. So instead of looking at the cerebrospinal fluid spaces on the CT scan, you actually sample that cerebrospinal fluid. And you know, obviously the less, least invasive way to do that would be to go in the lower back, well below where the spinal cord ends, with a needle. Um, obviously, it's a, as one might imagine, not the easiest procedure to tolerate, but if done you know, in expert hands, there's a little bit of a, a mosquito bite once you get the numbing medication. Then after that, should primarily be some pressure. And some of this cerebrospinal fluid is then sent off to the lab to evaluate for any evidence of blood. And that would be very, very critical in determining how we want to proceed with taking care of this patient if there's evidence of blood uh, or not. So that's number three, diagnosis. Now we move to number four, is what do we do when we do make the diagnosis of a brain aneurysm rupture? There's several different goals that need to be addressed, actually all fairly simultaneously. And that's why this care is provided in a neurointensive care unit or a critical care unit, uh, because so many things need to be done, not just do they need to be done, but um, done in a fairly standardized fashion because uh, there's so many potential outcomes that can occur. So one of the main priorities is to reduce the risk of rebleeding. It's important to realize that, you know, oftentimes people think that after an aneurysm bleeds, it's like an open faucet and it's just continuing to bleed. Uh, usually what happens that, is that bleeding occurs in an episodic fashion. Once you have an initial bleed, the body finds a way to form a temporary clot around that sort of breach in the artery. Much like if you were to get a cut on your skin, your body's coagulation system is fairly efficient in finding a way to seal off that, um, that breach. But as you might imagine, this is an artery that we're talking about. So that temporary clot may not be so durable. So we do need to fairly, fairly quickly uh, find a way to more durably seal off that cause of the bleeding such that you don't have any more bleeding again because that re any episodes of re-bleeding is associated with really uh, very serious consequences. The medical team also wants to make sure that you don't have a propensity to bleed. Some people are on blood thinners, uh, whether it's warfarin or Plavix or aspirin or other medications, or they just have a protein factor abnormality that may make them more susceptible to bleeding. And that those are things that we need to manage very early. Now, blood pressure management and pain control are, are, are things that we need to be very uh, cognizant of about. You know, these patients who've had a ruptured aneurysm need to be in a quiet, calm room immediately after they've been diagnosed. Um, and even when it comes to transport to a CT scanner or to any operating room, they shouldn't be moving themselves across the bed. The staff needs to move them so that they're as calm and comfortable as possible until the aneurysm which is the source of the bleeding, has been uh, secured off uh, so that there's no risk of re-bleeding. You know, I, I think you know, pain control is very important. And we also need to make sure you manage any elevations in the pressure within the brain. You know, it's important to remember that the skull is a fixed volume um, once you've reached adulthood. And any increase in blood uh, from the bleeding from the aneurysm can fairly quickly increase the pressure because you have no room, the, the skull can't accommodate that increased volume. And so that increased pressure can cause uh, injury or problems to the brain itself, and, and that needs to be, to be managed. And we'll talk about that, as well as the hydrocephalus, which is a term indicating that the spinal fluid that normally exists in the skull no longer has a, 
a, a, an adequate method of drainage and then the fluid then simply builds up in the brain and also adds to increased pressure within the brain. So those are a lot of the management strategies that occur immediately after the diagnosis of a ruptured brain aneurysm. Now, when we talk about number, number five here is aneurysm treatment, which is the first objective here is to reduce the risk of rebleeding. The, the more traditional approach that's been around for decades has been, it's referred to as clipping. It does involve a craniotomy where a part of the skull is removed and then access to the aneurysm is then carefully made and usually under the microscope, the aneurysm is visualized and several steps are made to allow the surgeon to get access to the neck of the aneurysm. And as you can see from that clip on the bottom left, again, both of these illustrations are from Brisbane's article in the New England Journal, um, that the clip is then able to essentially strangle the neck of the aneurysm so that you have this pouch here on the left, which had up until then uh, been accommodating blood under pressure and swirling around. But once you're able to sort of cinch together the neck and bring together the walls of the normal artery together, you form a fairly strong seal there. And this is not removed, it's simply most of the time just left there. It's now no longer under pressure, sort of like a deflated balloon. And this clip stays there as a permanent implant. And that solves the issue of any risk of rebleeding. Now, since the mid 90s, the FDA did approve uh, um, endovascular treatments of aneurysms uh, using a catheter-based approach, and, and it's minimally invasive. Much like a cardiac cath, if you feel around in the crease in your groin, you can feel a pulsing there. That's your femoral artery. Usually there's a small incision about a centimeter long in the crease in the groin where you gain access into the femoral artery, and under x-ray guidance, advance a catheter gently up to the arteries in the neck. And then from there, we are able to advance a, sorry, a small catheter into the dome of the aneurysm. And this is just representative uh, schematic showing this approach. And you can see that soft platinum coils are then gently advanced into the dome of the aneurysm. The, um, and then you, it also then serves the same goal of serving as a, you know, protecting this weakened wall of the aneurysm sac from any further contact with pulsatile arterial blood flow. Um, this is what a, angio machine looks like. Uh, there's two planes when we look at a side and from up and down and these are the large monitors that we have available to see these aneurysms which oftentimes are about five to seven millimeters in diameter in very high resolution so that we can um, do what we need to do uh, as precisely and accurately as possible. So this would be a, a video um, of, sorry. So this just illustrates exactly how you advance that small catheter into the dome of the aneurysm. And then you remove that wire that you use to get the catheter there. And then through that catheter, you advance the soft platinum coils, which are appropriately sized. And then once the positioning is satisfactory, they can be detached and the microcatheter is removed. And that again serves to uh, protect that weakened wall from any contact with blood flow and, and in doing so address the risk of rebleeding. Uh, these coils are designed or used such that they are very soft, they can be visualized under x-ray, and they actually help pr promote clot formation within them. Um, so it, it's, it's really a, uh, a, a wonderful tool and that it allows us to solve the problem in a less invasive way using spaces that already exist not having to create a space to get to the problem. And in fact, now, at least at Rush and probably around the country, about 80% of aneurysms are treated uh, with coil embolization. And here are some additional pictures which illustrate the concept. And to the right is a real life picture of what these coils look like. They're very, uh, um, very, uh, very small there. This is what an aneurysm looks like under angiography. This is a basilar terminus aneurysm. You can see the filling of the aneurysm before treatment. You can see this one as a ruptured aneurysm. It's very irregular shape, very large, and occurring at a branching point. And you can see after the coils are placed, we've been able to really not allow any contrast to uh, 
having a contact with the wall of the aneurysm, all the while maintaining blood flow in the in these branches that are adjacent to it, um, which obviously is very critical. So number six, we're past the halfway point here, <laughs> um, is is hydrocephalus, and this is what we mentioned a little bit earlier is that the body manufactures about a soda can of spinal fluid every day. And when blood is, when there's bleeding into the spinal fluid space, when the blood gets broken down and digested, uh, it can interfere with normal drainage of the cerebrospinal fluid. All the while, the spinal fluid keeps getting manufactured. And then you get this sort of dilation of these spaces. If you pay attention to this sort of you know, these dark, these larger black spaces here and here, and especially up here, and compared to a normal CT scan, what those spaces look like under normal circumstances, you can see how that can also contribute to just overall increased pressure within the skull. And so this is oftentimes treated with a drain that's placed usually on the dominant side, on the right side, and that helps provide an alternative uh, path for spinal fluid to be drained you know, outside of the body to help relieve the pressure within the skull. Sometimes some patients still, after about two weeks, um, still have difficulty in draining the spinal fluid normally and have to have what's referred to as a shunt that's tunneled underneath the skin and drained into the abdominal cavity. Um, and that's something that's a perm, you know, usually stays there. And a, a lot of patients actually do quite well with this for, for many years. So that's hydrocephalus. That's also one of the many things that I mentioned earlier that are that's being monitored for, monitored for and treated in the neurointensive care unit. Number seven is cerebral vasospasm. This occurs. Uh, this is an important um, potential complication that can occur after aneurysm rupture that we need to watch out for and be very vigilant about. So after blood rupture, uh, an aneurysm ruptures and blood is in the spinal fluid space. As that blood gets digested and broken down, it can also cause irritation through various, various uh, complex mechanisms and cause irritation and narrowing of these blood vessels. Why that's important is that that ultimately can not allow enough blood flow to certain parts of the brain and cause injury because of oxygen deprivation, which is essentially referred to as, as an ischemic stroke. So this is something that we monitor for usually with ultrasound on a daily basis, as well as uh, nursing evaluations of the patient. And um, if it does occur, usually medications are given prophylactically, but if severe enough, um, this may warrant uh, repeat catheter angiography and sometimes either administration of medications infused directly into the artery through catheters to help try and relax these blood vessels, or in some situations using a soft balloon to gently dilate these narrowed arteries to try to improve and augment the blood flow to that part of the brain which wasn't getting enough. And so this is an example of somebody with cerebral vasospasm um, before and after uh, the angioplasty using the balloon. Um, so that's something we really were very careful about watching for and, 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 and needing to treat maybe in about 20% of all patients uh, that, uh, that get admitted. Number eight is to be familiar and aware of what a neurocritical care does. I, I think it's it's not just your standard critical care unit that all medical patients can go to. This is some place that's uh, very highly trained and it really comes down to the staff, um, primarily the nurses and the physicians who know, sort of know the drill. They know what to look for. They know what sensitive signs that um, may, may occur that may prompt evaluation with other tests. And there are also a lot of machines which aren't necessarily shown here that can measure electrical wave activity, administer so many different types of diagnostic studies as well as even therapeutic um, um, tools uh, that can be done. And you, it's, it's so important to, to be at a place that sees a high volume of, of patients with a similar condition such that, for example, the nursing staff who evaluate you every hour can really be astute enough to pick up on any subtle changes that can occur, which may indicate um, an ongoing problem that you can catch early if possible. Um, it's a bit of an intimidating uh, place. There's so many alarms and numbers and 
activity going on. Patients actually don't get much sleep or rest when they're in the critical care unit, but um, hopefully as each day passes, they're a little bit closer to being more stable and hopefully being able to leave the intensive care unit. But hopefully because a lot of the issues that I kind of mentioned earlier have no longer become relevant. Number nine is really recovery. Uh, depending on where that blood is and depending on the extent of the injury, there may be physical impairments. It may be problems with vision, um, speech, swallowing, strength and sensation in the arms and legs. But sometimes even there, there are certain patients who have who make a fairly good recovery on the surface without any physical impairments, but have persisting cognitive impairments. And these can be frustrating in the sense that uh, they are not immediately visible by people around them, but they still notice them. Oftentimes it's related to um, memory problems and, and difficulty with attention. Some of this may just be related to the fact that they were uh, without sleep for almost two weeks uh, in the intensive care unit. There are also the, there are also the emotional impairments that I mentioned earlier uh, regarding the uncertainty about what may happen um, uh, and what to expect, especially because there's not much of a memory for what occurred. But hopefully a lot of these, these issues can be sorted out with your physician visits. You know, the appropriate referrals can be made to experts that may be able to understand and and help you along with the rehabilitation. And that's also, I really wanna highlight the value, uh, the tremendous value of support groups, such as you know, the, you know, the very robust network that the Joe Necro Foundation has. I think the nature of this type of problem can even make describing or elaborating on the problems one might have difficult. And sometimes it's nice to, and, and it's so helpful to see other folks who may be experiencing the same thing you are experiencing um, in terms of just helping with that sense of perhaps some loneliness or isolation in terms of feeling that nobody can understand what you're going through and they may be a rich resource for for referrals whether locally or, or nationally uh, to help with the specific problems one might have so that that's that's an important part of the recovery process it's oftentimes not so easy even among those patients with smaller amount of bleeding, uh, but there's, a, there's still a good number of patients that actually make a surprisingly good recovery. So it's something that um, can be complex, but there are a lot of resources around. And lastly is, is sort of the future, is what to expect after you've survived a uh, ruptured brain aneurysm. Oftentimes um, the issues uh, hopefully become easier and simpler with time, but uh, what we talk about a lot in the office is sort of the issue of surveillance imaging, um, what modality, whether it's a catheter angiogram, MRA, or a CT angiogram, how often it can be done, and, and the duration. And hopefully, if things look very reassuring over time, the frequency of the surveillance imaging can be increasingly spaced apart. There's also issues of screening family members, particularly if you have two first degree relatives with uh, brain aneurysms. And what's the best strategy to do that without getting unnecessary testing and potentially unnecessary information, but still being cognizant of any potentially increased risk that uh, allows you to potentially catch something earlier. Lastly, or uh, next is prevention strategies. Uh, oftentimes we talk about the importance of blood pressure control and vigilance and making sure you, you do regularly check your own blood pressure as that's not, not something, if it's elevated, that you can sense oftentimes. And the importance of uh, smoking cessation, um, as well as there may be opportunities depending on the center you've been treating at uh, to potentially contribute to research. Uh, we've been involved in a couple studies involving the role of potentially low dose estrogen in perimenopausal women with brain aneurysm, as well as um, uh, online uh, uh, memory enhancement tools to facilitate uh, with uh, memory improvement after a ruptured aneurysm. And there may be other opportunities to help, especially if you've happened to have had a, a very good outcome. Uh, maybe there's something that, that can be done to, to help future uh, generations if, if they were to encounter the same problem. So that's really all I had in terms of the 10, 10 things I thought would be helpful to, to be aware of. 
after a ruptured brain aneurysm. I'm really looking forward to any types of questions uh, that people might have, um, whether it's related to this or something else, and, and maybe be able to um, have a discussion about that. Yes, uh, thank, can you hear me, Dr. Chen? Yes. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was awesome. Um, it was super informative. Um, and we've actually had a, a decent amount of questions come in. So I'm going to go ahead and just start off with um, the first one. Um, so Vanessa asked, um, in re this, she asked about AVMs, but I think it can be applied to brain aneurysms. Um, are, are pregnant women at greater risk of having a ruptured aneurysm or AVM? And if so, has there been any research done on this? And if so, what has the research found? Yes, it's, you know, I, I think this issue does come up on occasion and it's obviously a very high intensity uh, situation. Most of the time we encounter this scenario with somebody with a known or pre-existing either AVM or, or br brain aneurysm. And as the pregnancy progresses, particularly when it comes to delivery, what is the safest method of delivery? And nobody really knows. There's not. There's never going to be a, a randomized study comparing normal vaginal delivery and cesarean section in patients with brain a AVMs or brain aneurysms. Obviously, for many reasons, not limited to the fact that you know there's many different types of brain aneurysms and AVMs with varying levels of risk. But I would say that if you know, I think. It really, I, I think an understanding of the type of the AVM or the aneurysm that you're talking about, if it's a three millimeter blister aneurysm, you know, or, you know, a bleb like aneurysm located, um, you know, at the base of the skull versus a 10 millimeter aneurysm at the anterior commuting artery, you know, those obviously have different risks and you may want to consider treatment of them um, before delivery. But oftentimes, cesarean section would allow you to deliver the baby with the minimal amount of fluctuation and blood pressure that may occur during uh, normal labor and, and the pushing associated with it. So I don't think pregnancy in and of itself contributes to aneurysm or AVM formation, but it is interesting that aneurysms do occur uh, much more commonly in women than men. It's about you know, three times more common. And the average age of rupture is 52, which is actually more of the menopausal uh, age range rather than the sort of childbearing age. And so that's actually what's guided our research in looking at the possible role of low dose estrogen in helping to reduce the risk of aneurysm, either formation, growth, or, or rupture. Okay, great. That's really interesting. Um, thank you for answering that. Um, the next question is. Why do some people lose consciousness at the time of bleed and others are mobile and coherent? I think this has to do with the extent of the bleeding uh, and, and the speed at which the body is able to stop that bleeding, as well as how big of a tear that, um, that occurs in the aneurysm and how much blood comes out all at once. So that's just, it basically has to do with the sudden increase in the pressure in the brain. Some patients, there's, there's several different scales that are used by physicians, either the Hunt or, Hunt or Hess scale um, that, can, that uses a, as a description of the amount of blood that's in the brain. And that oftentimes it was what determines whether somebody passes out um, when, when, a, when an aneurysm ruptures or if they just develop a, a bad headache and are still able to, to walk around and talk and things. And it, it's really... Um, it really has to do with the amount of bleeding, which is not anything anybody really has any control over. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so the next question from Lisa is, what is the risk of re-bleed for a coiled aneurysm that has compacted and has two, and is two to three millimeters in size? Oh boy, that's a fairly specific question, <laughs> but, specific, this but... Situation does, yeah, this, this situation does come up quite often. Uh, coiling, over time, there was, in its early history, there was a very high concern about any type of recanalization, you know, even in the range of two to three millimeters, and what risk that recanalization may pose on future rehemorrhage. Uh, but, but then it became increasingly clear as more and more patients were treated and they were followed over 
more and more years that some amount of recanalization is actually not associated uh, with any type, you know, it hasn't been reported with any rebleeding. It not necessarily how much of a neck remnant that you see secondary to coil compaction, that's the concern. The concern has more to do with whether the coils are compacted sort of to one side and you have a portion of that dome of the aneurysm wall now being exposed to blood flow. Sometimes you can have an aneurysm that's fairly large and the neck of the aneurysm, there is some compaction and you see a little bit of neck filling, but if the entire dome from what you can see is covered very well with coil, that wouldn't make me as concerned as say, you know, a smaller aneurysm with a similar amount of neck recanalization, but if it's really what to one side and, um, and the dome is exposed, that would be a, a reason to consider retreatment uh, of that aneurysm. But interestingly enough, now that we have uh, newer devices, in addition to just simply, in addition to just placing coils alone, but we also have uh, what are called flow diverters. These provide much more of a cleaner, elegant um, solution to providing exact and precise net coverage. Um, uh, at the aneurysm neck to really make this issue of coil compaction less of an issue now than it was before. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering that. Um, sorry, we just have a lot of questions. I'm trying to filter through them. Um, <laughs> so someone asked, how often does a clot form at the site after coiling is done? It is a... Clot formation uh, is one of the complications that we are concerned about um, as you're coiling an aneurysm. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's, this is a surprisingly technical question, but I'd be happy to address it. it you know, it's probably relevant to somebody. Uh, but nevertheless, it's something that there are varying strategies that one can use when doing the procedure to prevent it. Um, oftentimes it has to do with just the the characteristics of the patient that can contribute to the formation. Somebody who has plaque buildup, um, uh, you know, like you oftentimes see in the arteries in the heart, and if they happen to have some in the brain, that can increase the risk for clot formation up in the brain. But fortunately, as 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 frightening as it may sound, oftentimes if detected early, uh, when a clot forms in its early stages, it's fairly amenable to uh, having it dissolve with the right types of medications if you give it early. The longer the clot has time to organize, it becomes a little bit more difficult to dissolve it. But um, anybody who, uh, you know, who, who does, has a lot of experience with coil embolization of aneurysms is hopefully fairly well versed in not just detecting the subtle signs of a clot forming in its initial stages, but also being familiar with what types of medications that can be given immediately upon detection of it to dissolve it and, and hopefully minimize any kind of damage that can occur from that clot forming. It's a known complication. Fortunately, it only occurs in about three to six of percent of all cases, but obviously depending on the characteristics of the patient being treated, that can determine if it's higher or lower. Okay, interesting. Um, I received an interesting question. Um, is I'm, I forgive me for uh, pronouncing this, but is asnomia permanent? Um, they're 18 months out and unable to smell or taste. Okay, this, um, it may have to do with where the aneurysm was located and where most of the blood uh, sort of uh, was located as well. Um, if it occurs in the inferior frontal lobes, you may have had an anterior communicating artery aneurysm. Um, that if the clot, you know, that hematoma or that collection of blood that leaked out of the aneurysm was big enough, it can just from the pressure alone cause some sort of some amount of injury to the brain and and potentially um, interfere with your ability to smell. Um, that's one possibility. It may also be just you know affecting the olfactory nerves at some point from where the sensory endings, you know, originate in the in the nose and in the back of the throat to to where where they go to the brain. Uh, it's you know, I, it's certainly a symptom that's been described before in somebody with a ruptured aneurysm, um, and uh, it 
it, as long as there's not any ongoing hydrocephalus or any other medical issues that your physician can detect, it may end up just being unfortunately a consequence of the initial bleed, but we just, it's important to, you know, make sure that if it persists more than one might expect that a physician can, hopefully knows you well, can, can evaluate for any pot potential confounding factors. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chen, for answering that. Um, the next question, so what is the current thinking on neuroplasticity and recovering from a hemorrhagic stroke? In the past, it was thought that the, that patients plateau, but is there more support for the concept that you can recover and gain more function back even after several years following a stroke? I, I think it's, it's very variable. Um, um, I think it depends a lot, as one might imagine, on the patient's age and the ability of, you know, to compensate and bounce back from this type of injury, and that can potentially, you know, contribute, you know, play some role in this concept of plasticity. I think this issue really comes um, becomes even more relevant now with regards to research when it comes to stem cells. I think there's been some work. Uh, being done out of Northern California when it comes to ischemic stroke, when, when there's uh, not enough blood flow to the brain and there's cell injury that occurs through that mechanism, which is different from obviously hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, some of the work is still very, very much in the early stages. They're doing s clinical studies for this. Um, but I think oftentimes uh, there's not really much of a choice. I, I think the argument does become more relevant when you're discussing with insurers as to how much longer to help cover rehabilitation services, physical occupational therapy, and things like that. But I think for younger patients, one would expect that duration of having the potential to continually improve from their deficits to be a little bit longer over time. And there's so many factors that contribute to this. It's it's really hard to predict, uh, uh, you know, the, the the actual duration for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question: um, Do clips last a lifetime? They had brain surgery in 1969, and he was nine years old. Yes, they are. They they are designed, and they, they do last a lifetime. Um, they, uh, they're inert metal or they're, they're safe to go to, uh, you know, airport scanners and, you know, it's, it's, uh, shouldn't be, shouldn't be too much of a concern. Okay. Awesome. Um, so someone said, does taking 325 milligrams of aspirin a day damage brain arteries in any way? Generally, no. It's thought to be fairly protective uh, for uh, platelet aggregation. Um, that may be a, a reason for developing strokes. Um, in fact, many patients who have aneurysms that need to be treated with using a stent or a stent-like device are taking aspirin for quite some time. Okay. So. Um, next question. Um, they have a coiled, um, ruptured aneurysm. Um, they're getting monitored with an MRI every year and there are no signs of more aneurysms. Why is monitoring blood pressure so important? Blood pressure is very important because uh, that's the one, mechan one of several things that leads to aneurysm formation, growth, and rupture. It's not just the propensity of your blood vessels to be a little bit weaker and form them, but it's also the pressure that's driving the formation of the aneurysm. Um, patients with high blood pressure, and in particular those who may abuse drugs and have a sudden spike in blood pressure, are the ones we see that can develop rapid growth of new aneurysms or, or recurrent rupture of aneurysms. And, and so I think it's just one of those, one of the few things they can't control your genetics, you can't control your age or your gender, but you know the blood pressure is one of the few things you can control mm -hmm. that uh, that can decrease the risk of of aneurysms forming. It's just less stress on your arteries, and hopefully that makes intuitive sense. 
Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so we received another question and family history is often discussed when it comes to aneurysms or AVNs. Um, can you speak to that at all? Um, for example, is a sibling or a child more likely to have an AVM or aneurysm? I, I think this is a, a challenging topic. There's not been a clear cut um, genetic, you know, you know, family history sort of uh, risk uh, that's been established. As mentioned earlier, aneurysms form and, and potentially rupture from multiple reasons, and the genetic predisposition may be one of many variables uh, that that factor in. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if you do have two first degree relatives with an aneurysm, particularly if it's a if they've had ruptured aneurysms then I think screening and generally we recommend an MRA of the brain without contrast uh, would be a reasonable approach. You know, an MRA of the brain without contrast really poses no medical risk to the patient. There's no ionizing radiation. There's no contrast that's administered. Even if somebody was pregnant, you could safely uh, get that test done. And it usually in, in most places provides sufficient resolution to be able to tell confidently that an aneurysm doesn't exist. Um, and then the other question is what age is usually uh, most appropriate. And because aneurysms occur more commonly about in the 40s through 60s, generally we recommend, you know, in the early 30s would be a good time to start. It's fairly rare in the pediatric population or even in the 20s. So that might be some guidelines to then make your decision. It may be challenging to have it covered by insurance. But, you know, I think oftentimes if there's sufficient documentation of the family history, uh, it, it would seem like it's something that could be reasonably covered. Okay, that's really good to know. Um, um, let's see. So someone said if you had a leaking aneurysm without a rupture, does this do permanent damage? I have problems with memory and multitasking. Is this from the leak or the, um, the surgery? Um, I'm not sure I, I understand. I, I think the surgery could cause additional injury, um, and that's that's something that nobody you know wants to to do. But sometimes, in order to achieve the goal of making sure that aneurysm is durably sealed off, um, that 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 may that may happen, and so that could add to the problems one might have in addition to those that were caused by the bleeding of the aneurysm. You know, it really is, it really takes somebody to look at the scan, to look at the pattern of the bleeding um, when, when you first get to the hospital, look at where the aneurysm is located, look at any scans that were done after the treatment. And a lot of that can then um, help you figure out what may be explaining what problems that you have. And again, if there's any problems that persist, there are some ongoing processes that can occur in the weeks to months after a ruptured aneurysm that are still things that are potentially treatable uh, that could that could help minimize these symptoms. You know, some patients have seizures that could manifest in, in, in unusual ways. Some people can have, you know, changes in the nutrition because they have trouble swallowing. Some people can have memory problems. You know, it, it, there's several different things that we try to evaluate for to make sure we're not missing anything we can do something about. But it is true, frustratingly enough, that some things are just very persistent that were caused by the initial either bleed or from the procedure to treat the aneurysm that are, are gonna be there for a while. And there's not, unfortunately, not a whole lot we can do anything about. Okay, thank you. Um... So earlier you had mentioned uh, low dose estrogen. Um, so someone's just wondering what is the correlation between um, low dose estrogen and aneurysms? So a lot of what raised this research question was one of the medical students who I've, I was able to work with, she's now a nurse surgery resident. She raised the question of why do aneurysms occur more commonly in women? And, uh, you know, we looked into it, you know, most other cerebrovascular disease, whether it's, you know, ischemic stroke actually occur more commonly in men, but it's just strange why aneurysms have this sort of female disparity. Mm -hmm. And it's thought that it's related to the severe drop in estrogen that occurs uh, 
at or around menopause that can also manifest as changes in your hair uh, consistency, that your skin becomes a little more fragile and less has less tensile strength. And we, we were thinking that the similar changes can occur in the arteries and make them a little bit uh, less strong and compliant and are a, and maybe then that's what leads to you know and there are large studies looking at over 2,000 patients with brain aneurysms and not only is the average age of you know and the average age of rupture and, and most of them you know three to two rate for women and the average age of rupture is 52 so it, it does seem like it really points us to this drop in estrogen as playing you know a, a significant role perhaps in, in aneurysm information. So our thought is that perhaps in perimenopausal women, obviously this may not apply in women who are years past menopause, but those who are experiencing those that transition in terms of the drop in estrogen, if administration, if deemed safe by a reproductive endocrinologist of low dose estrogen um, may help mitigate this sudden drop and may not lead to the changes in uh, in the arteries that would put somebody who's at risk for aneurysms to progressing. Again, this is all research. This is not clinical recommendation. This is something that we're actively studying. So this is just a thought process I'm sharing with you, but it's um, hopefully it, it's something that we can provide some evidence in favor of because ultimately it may, may yield a potentially non-surgical treatment option for, for brain aneurysms uh, in the future. And that, that's kind of what we've been working on. That's really interesting. Um, we've had a couple of comments just from people who saying that they were interested in that research that's being done. Um, one, another question. So what do you know about the new, I'm not sure if they meant mesh pipe used. I ha they have one. I'm not, I'm not sure if you know what exactly that is, Dr. Chen. <laughs> Yes, I think they're, they may be referring to the pipeline device, which is a sort of low porosity braided stent-like device, which is placed within the artery that the aneurysm comes off of. It's FDA approved in 2012. Um, it, it's a fairly new device, but it's been, the, the results from what we've seen in the U.S. have been very promising. There are several others from other companies that will be out on the market soon that follow similar uh, concepts in terms of its you know technical features but it, it's it's really changing the way that we are able to treat aneurysms it provides what some people refer to as more of a surgical uh, solution and that it really treats the neck much uh, more definitively rather than filling up the sac with coils which can you know shift over time uh, so it's it's very promising and there's a lot more there, there are even um, you know some agents that are being impregnated on the wall of these, these devices to even further facilitate its, its safe use. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like we just have one or two questions left, so we'll wrap up. Um, just one of them is, um, so what, what do you recommend when patient, what do you recommend when someone thinks they're having a aneurysm rupture, what do you recommend they say to the EMS? Um, all, my, all you can really do is hopefully communicate clearly as possible what you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully, you know, and it really, it, it is a good question because depending on where you live and what type of medical centers are close to where you live, that can determine the type of whether the diagnosis is made quickly and accurately, and if there are any treatment options that are immediately available. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, usually you're able to, I, what, but at the same time, I think CT scans of the head are done, are fairly, are widely available, and the threshold among emergency room physicians to order them are fairly low. So anytime you say, this is the worst headache of my life, or something like that, that's probably enough to get an ER physician to get a head CT. And that usually provides us with quite a bit of information in terms of sorting out is this, you know, a secondary cause of headaches, which is secondary to something serious or maybe more of a primary headache syndrome um, that uh, 
that you know that that's maybe like a migraine or tension headache and so i i think it's challenging but you know and i i get this call all the time from patients you know they're at home they've got a bad headache do i need to go to the er or not or nobody wants to go to the er and it's 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 a tough one you know and uh um you know I, it is it is inconvenient but it's really that scan is so critical to um sort of figuring out a lot of the questions one might have in terms of is this something serious or not mhm thank you um so we'll end with just one more question if you don't mind um someone said we had a couple questions like this um but they said after 4 years of a ruptured aneurysm i have no physical deficits but still have poor short term memory um they get overstimulated by sounds that lead to migraines and they can't do high impact activities like running they've gotten more tolerant and their short term memory is better um where they can remember 2 to 3 months back but will they go back to being normal or will it plateau and stay this way um you know i think it's everybody responds differently mm -hmm. um, and, and i think every, every every time i think the more you're able to do i mean i think the one thing that we can do something about is if there are any symptoms or problems related to depression that may grow over time as a part of the recovery process which can be a real thing that interferes with the recovery in terms of motivation and initiative to participate not just in any type of therapy that's prescribed, but also just get out and interact with people and confront everyday problems. Because a lot of that is what contributes to the recovery process is just getting out and, and, and you know, interacting with other people, challenging yourself. And, and, and then that's, as you might imagine, sort of a use it or lose it kind of thing. And I mean, it doesn't want to, it's not like a sort of, it's not that easy sometimes because there could be other things that make this a lot more difficult than it sounds but mm -hmm. um, but i think having a support system around you know having resources like support groups you know like from the joan equal foundation or from any other resource uh can be the one little thing that helps helps move you along to be able to do a little bit more um uh, with, with your day-to-day -day activities and, and and you know i you know those types of questions are hard i mean I, i've never experienced a ruptured aneurysm myself so it, it's hard for me to really fully appreciate you know the meaning behind a question like that but um i i just it, and it's hard i mean all i know is that as long as we're not missing anything ongoing um all, all we potentially have to do is just is just keep keep at it um mm -hmm. <laughs> No, it's tough. It's, yeah, it's hard. Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, I just want to thank you, Dr. Chen. This webinar was awesome. Um, we've had a lot of comments from the audience saying it was super helpful um, and informative. Um, just so everyone knows, uh, we're going to have another webinar with Dr. Chen. Um, it hasn't been announced yet. You guys are the first ones to know. So it will be on Wednesday, September 27th at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Um, and I'm going to pop the link here in the chat box and you guys can go ahead and register for that. Um, it will be on unruptured brain aneurysms. So 10 things to know about unruptured brain aneurysms. And thank you again, Dr. Chen. Um, we are looking forward to the next webinar. Thank you.